I think, um, well, we're all fascinated, I imagine, everyone here, by what's going on in Europe. So I'm going to treat this actually as a conversation. What I'm going to do is ask her a couple of questions. But from the very beginning, please feel free to come in or ask anything you want, say anything you want. Because we do think that we're a small group. It's better to have a conversation rather than have uh, a monologue or even a dialogue. So we'll, we, it's, we're planning this as uh, quite casual. And uh, I'm just going to begin with the question that I think many of us actually have, which is that when you read the papers, we all know about the crisis. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about the Eurozone crisis later. But there is a broad uh, narrative about the crisis that comes out, certainly in the Indian press, which is of um, uh, you know, German taxpayers refusing to keep footing the bill for all these lazy southerners. Basically, that's the broad perception. And therefore, imposing very severe austerity, which the countries of peripheral Europe are now, or the people in these countries are less and less able to, uh, to manage. And therefore, the rise of protests. So there is this image of, um, shall we say, you know, the big bad wolf of Germany in the shape of this rather motherly Angela Merkel, but nonetheless, you know, coming bearing down on the rest of Southern Europe. And uh, also a perception that if anything, the German public is completely with her in imposing the austerity and even worse, actually thinks that they should not be asked to give anything more. So I'm going to first ask you, Christina, how true is this perception that the German public is behind uh, Merkel in this? Well, I would say um, from the perspective of those who are active against the austerity imposing government in Germany at the moment, this is a very true perceptive. So we kind of adopted this, um, this notion of we're doing politics in the heart, in the belly of the yeah. beast, like yeah. normally the uh, left American activists were yeah. talking about themselves. So I think um, there is some, some truth to that. Um, and uh, the perception of the crisis in Germany <coughs> and on the everyday leverage is a little bit um, complicated. I think there are a lot of people who feel that they, they got through the crisis all right and they don't want to mess with that. So it's like, okay, we kind of got away and we, looking to, the, to Spain, to Greece and to all these grievances the people are enduring there, they feel like, okay, this, uh, they got it worse or they got it bad and we have to stick to our, our well, trail and, and try to get away with it. And so there's this tendency of blocking ideas of solidarity, ideas of, um, of being linked to, to the fate of these other people. And on the other hand, I think it, um, the perception of the crisis has very much to do with the fact that there has been a very strong uh, low wage strategy being imposed in Germany from the, starting with the Social Democrats at the late 90s, and which basically came in, in, into effect in the, the early 2000 years. And um, they implemented the biggest low wage market in the Western industrial countries in this not very big country, Germany, <laughs> and, um, and imposed the workfare regime. And so there was a significant change in what people have as wages, how, what uh, level of stress they uh, face in everyday life, how they get along, and and it's very hard. It was very hard for that to be part of an open discussion or a public discussion. So a lot of people felt that this is, this is the way it has to be, and so so the, I think for for as a consequence um, for the the discussion on the crisis, for the, many people have the feeling, <coughs> well, crisis is their everyday feeling. So it's nothing new. Um, and the other, the other side is that uh, we've been giving like yeah. for 10 years. There's been no wage raise. There's actually been a um, uh, lowering of the wages of about 30% in an average uh, uh, view on that. And um, so we've been giving all this time and we're not willing to give any more. And, and so by the the press hinting them on the notion that this is just because the Greeks want more and more and you have to give and give, people refuse 
this feeling of you know being willing to give and just uh, shift the targets from who is making them pay uh, away from the government from the from their everyday experiences in their work life towards the outer outside enemy of Greek and all these lazy people there so I think that is that is a very strong notion yeah. in the everyday life. Although there are uh, attempts to organize protests yeah. and, and again. You know, one of the fascinating things from the outside is that, say in 2008, 2009, the enemy was finance. Okay, mm -hmm. and everybody knew the enemy was finance. Governments, the real sector, investors, and people of course, okay? And everywhere you went, even in Europe, there was this feeling that finance has to be reined in. Fi now we are in a worse situation. We are going to enter a deeper financial crisis. And in fact, those who had caused the earlier crisis are not only scot free, but they got bailouts and were able to give themselves larger bonuses, etc. But the enemy is no longer finance. The enemy is other people right. in different countries. How did this happen so quickly? I mean, <laughs> I wonder too. <laughs> um, well, I think we, we had this rather. Um, well, for German perspective, rather large demonstrations in 2009 and 2010, yeah. which were under this banner of we won't pay for your crisis. Mm -hmm. And this was um, immediately understood as being against banks, yeah. capital, the leading politicians. Um, and then with this European crisis spreading and the ver this idea of austerity and of overspending being yeah. being the at the core of this crisis the this I, I think it's partly because the whole thing was depicted and how it was depicted in the media as well but this maybe or it is just because people had the feeling that there's nothing they can do about the finance system I don't know it, it was a very successful ideological shift that was produced very much by the government and um, by accompanying um, discussions to locate the, the, the crisis yeah. away from capital, away from the yeah. banking system at the periphery of, of Europe and, and blaming them for, for that. And, and actually there's, I don't, I think if we would organize today with this, we won't pay for your crisis slogan, yeah. I think people would uh, understand it the other way around, like being hinted oh, against oh, the, okay. because that's the kind of, yeah, yeah, against yeah. we won't pay for the Greeks. And sometimes it's there's a, even an everyday level of experience of these things, like, for example, uh, those people who have a little bit of money in the banks and um, they kind of have this very uh, modest way of investing, you know, the bank um, bank will advise you what to do and, and then you go there and they say, yeah, well, you might, you might want to shift this money here because if Greek defaults, you might lose your interest here. So, so there's a very, very everyday experience of, okay, I have a personal interest in Greek not defaulting on their debt, which is, of course, besides of that, and for all those people who don't have any money in the bank, uh, not of any interest at all. But it's like, and it, it's going to be coming back to yeah, their... Sort of day. implicating everybody yeah. in, in the... Yeah. I just want to give a little bit of background because everybody may not be following in detail the, the Eurozone thing, if you don't mind, no, uh, Christina. Look, you know, that there is this whole thing that first Greece and then now Portugal, Ireland, Spain, and possibly Italy, okay, are in positions near default. But basically, Greece is at the top of the line. And the perception is it's because they've overspent, okay? But this is a narrative that misses out that what really happened after the Eurozone was formed is the creation of a common ability to borrow externally for all of the Eurozone countries. And what that meant was that these countries in the South got very large capital inflows. A lot of it from German banks, Austrian banks, Dutch banks, French banks. In fact, those, those four countries' banks account for 80% accounted before the, for 80% of the money held, borrowed by these countries except for Greece, which had fudged its government accounts with the help of Goldman Sachs, okay? And this was only discovered when the new socialist government came, when PASOK came, and they looked at the accounts and discovered that everything had been fudged. And then, a bit like idiots, they went and announced that this is not the real deficit, it's much more. And then there was this big capital flight and collapse. 
but in the other countries it wasn't the government okay the government has actually been running budget surpluses so spain and ireland had three percent of gdp surplus they were not spending too much the opposite okay even today spain's public debt to gdp ratio is lower than germany's so it's not true that they've all been crazy and overspending what happened is that their banks got into big trouble in 2008 with the financial crisis and to save their banks they had to take over the bad loans and they ended up holding the losses okay so particularly spain and ireland basically they are running deficits because they gave large bailouts to the banks Having done that, they're now in deficit, and then the bank, the same finance is turning around and saying, oh my God, look at you, you have terrible deficits. You have to immediately cut wages, cut spending on hospitals, cut spending on schools, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the story is different from the story that we get told. It's, it's actually a story of finance capital creating imbalances, which have become unsustainable, and then because they're unsustainable, there's a crisis, and then the burden of the crisis is then paid for by the people, okay? I want to ask you now, Christina, this story we never get, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the media. Mm -hmm. This is something, I mean, look, we all know what the media does in India, but if anything, you know, I, I ha it's hard to think of a worse media, but possibly <laughs> the US kind of tops the list. But look at even European media. I mean, how big a role do you think they are playing even in intensifying this crisis? Yeah. Well, I think maybe it's worse than, than the US, actually, in, that, in a way that, that because of the privatized media sector yeah. in, in the US, there is some kind of polarization. You will get yeah. people like Bill Maher or John Stewart or people who, yeah. who are really you know, addressing these yeah. issues. And in Germany, this, aside from some left newspapers, um, which are not spread very far. There is, well, there has been up to, I'd say this, I'm not sure about the date, but uh, when the beginning, in the beginning, there has been a basically unisono tale to told about uh, Greece. Uh -huh. That was exactly what you just depicted. And there was no, there was no, um, nobody telling the different story on a scale that is basically yeah. received on, on a large scale scale um, discussion. There has, have been some slight changes in that. There are some you know, people saying, OK, if, if the people don't, won't have enough money to consume anything, there will be a, an economic problem, especially for, for countries um, like Germany who live on exports. So somebody has to buy these exports. Otherwise, yeah. uh, that we will be part of this uh, spiral as well. So that has changed a little bit, but there's basically there's which is extremely strong is the ideology of debt. That is wrong. That has to yeah. be um, fought. And the, this whole discussion that um, you need public debt for investment, for example, or that there's some kind of uh, justice in for even in making in ha um, in taking up debt to to build a bridge, for yeah. example. I mean, it's why should only one generation pay for a bridge yeah. that is used by three? So yeah. that is. The, the sense of uh, yeah. having debt on that. You, you uh, yeah. loan, you get the money and, and all the generations pay for that. And this whole discourse is basically gone and it's even with, and it's far mm -hmm. into the social democrats, the whole social democrats, even partly this, the left party, that the people say, we can't um, leave our children and grandchildren with all these debts as if they would have to pay personally for the state debt. So it's like, oh, it's yeah. a very, very strong discourse yeah. and no, it's almost impossible to, to uh, implement an alternative to that because people s think of themselves and think of their fridge and their <laughs> bank account and say, okay, debt is something that is bad and so we all have to get rid yeah. of that. that. So that is, and the other thing is that um, I think throughout the era of neoliberalism, this, um, the idea that uh, public spending and uh, public infrastructure and public social s yeah. the social system is some kind of wealth um, yeah. that has that is to be cherished. Well, <laughs> no problem. Um, so this this notion has been very uh, much reduced uh, in favor of privatization, yeah. and it's hard to pick up on that and to push that again. 
Um, so the, the, the answer on the neoliberal crisis is only more of neoliberalism and more of austerity and not so much uh, turning around in this perspective. Let me open, is there, I mean, would anybody like to ask something to Christina, make a comment at this point? Because I have some more questions, but I mean, as I said, yeah, this is a small group, so we can, we can be, you know, Please don't. get into <laughs> discussion at any point. But if you don't, I want to <laughs> take up again, you know, on this, uh, this uh, the struggles in Europe, mm -hmm. okay? Last year, all summer was about Occupy. In fact, even till winter, e mm -hmm. even in the midst mm -hmm. of the snow and the ice, there were these tents, and it was actually quite inspiring for a lot of people. <laughs> it's, all, it's all kind of <laughs> evaporated. <laughs> what happened? Um, well, I would say um, there are different paths that were taken. Um, some of them, some of the big struggles aren't gone. They are just no longer reported on. Yeah. There has been a two million march in Spain, which yeah. was basically absent from me media in Europe. Whereas, um, what, and the people still hit the streets. What they don't do anymore, or what they are not allowed <laughs> to do anymore, is uh, stay there. Mm -hmm. So the, peop the police is very forceful mm -hmm. against occupation tents and all mm -hmm. these things. And um, there are some parts in, in Spain where the miners have taken up some astonishing <laughs> militant version of self-defense or claiming their subsidies for, for the mining area with like, uh, well, very hard, fighting the police very hard yeah. on that. And the police came, came back on them and then just moved on to their huge demonstration they were having in Madrid and they, they hurt so many people so that there is a new, new um, mode of uh, police violence, I would say, that is driving these people from off the streets. And of course, there's only so much sitting in the street you can do. You know, if you, if you stay in the street for weeks and months and nothing is changing, yeah. people will say, you know, I can sit at home. Yeah. And, care, and they, people have, have to care more and more for everyday things yeah. like how to organize food, how to organize mm -hmm. rent or living, and which relative to move into when, if they have to sell the house and things like that. In Greece, I would say there's um, Greece, and that is, this is partly true for Spain as well. There has been a shift for, from not only protesting in the streets, but deepening the resistance uh, to some everyday solidarity networking, mm -hmm. building food banks, building uh, committees to mm -hmm. care for housing. It's a little bit similar like in the US where, where the, the term is used is occupy the hood. So yeah. go back to your neighborhood, organize the people oh, there, and organize your everyday things together, and then come back out and, and address the questions that, that are not able to be solved in the neighborhood. So, but still, there's, yeah. there's an... And the other thing is, um, at least in, in Greece, there has been a change in... or but, but it's not... There has been a development that the, the formerly the protests were very distant towards parliamentary representation. And with this new left party, the Syriza coalition, they, um, they were able to integrate a lot of people of this protest into this organized version of protest. And it's not, it's not like we're, now we're going all, all going to the parliament and things are only happening in the parliament, but it's, it's they, they organized both at the same time and they organized these activists Solidarity networks as well, and it's a little bit similar in, in Spain. Um, the uh, Izquierda Unida opened up their lists for indignados mm -hmm. from people from the organized yeah. people from the street to um, to be part of their their parliamentary uh, group. So, but still, I, I of course, I mean, things have calmed down a little bit in the in the, in the U.S. and Canada. Well, in the U.S. at least, there has been a very forceful police yeah. as well uh, hitting in the In Canada, there are still protests, right? Or yeah. To the students right. Uh, students, yeah. yeah in, in especially in Quebec, although yeah. Quebec kind of has this very special uh, story that they have this not very high uh, student fees that are about to be imposed. Mm -hmm. Um, and that brought out so many people on every uh, on a daily uh, ratio <laughs> of, of demonstration, and and then broadened towards uh, talking about austerity and uh, spending right. every day. So it's it it's, it wasn't 
um, exactly an outcome of the Occupy movement or something. But it's still it's an, a huge everyday um, yeah. uh, protest there. Okay, I'm going to come back to the, the good news, if you like, or the, yeah. po the progressive alternatives <laughs> later, because we may as well end on something that makes us feel slightly more optimistic. But I, I want to ask you about the other part of politics that has grown in Europe now, which is the right, okay? And uh, in different forms, but it's a peculiar kind of thing which is going on, right? Because you have Beppe Grillo and that group in Italy, which is, uh, I mean, the only defining feature is that he says all politics uh, is ridiculous, is, is a joke, and I'm against the euro. Right. Yeah? And then you have the other groups which are quite openly racist. Right. I mean, Marine Le Pen and et cetera, et cetera. So what, what do you see in store for Europe on that front in terms of? Well, that's very hard to say because uh, the moods are changing very quickly. But if you look, for example, uh, France, um, uh, at, at uh, Greece, and some, some parts of Spain, there's a, a very vivid racism against mm. immigrants, which is a um, so common development yeah. in the yeah. crisis that yeah. there are those foreigners, those poor people who are, and they, they organize raids against them. Um, so they really, they, they get really hunted in this. There are some food kitchens that are asking yeah, right. for Greek citizen cards yeah. before they give food. Yeah, that's the, that's the right, the yeah. right wing. Yeah. They, they uh, propose these. Pro the, the right wing in Greece especially proposes that uh, social security <laughs> and solidarity networks and all these are uh, just for Greek citizens. And, and there are some openly <coughs> fascist movements in, throughout Europe who very much try to um, take up um, yeah, well, the, the one thing is it is not so complicated. They're just organizing all this anger and trying to blame. And, and of course, it falls along the line of, of blaming, for example, in Germany, blaming the Greek. You can easily jump on that for a right discourse. In Germany, the, the organized far right isn't that strong because of our very special history, but, but still the, this everyday discussion is strong. And in, I don't know, it's always been like where the left is weak the right grows and at the moment the left has some difficulties to um, to take the place and claim the um, the explanation and the resistance towards the crisis for themselves I, mean, I think Greece they they did actually very good I mean it they had like 26 percent after in the in this latest um, election when they had what was it 4.7 and the one before so that was I think that is a huge victory because it could have easily gone the other way around and um, so that I think is something where the rest of Europe should learn from how to combine the forces in the street forces in Parliament and an everyday um, way of resisting and organizing solidarity there I wouldn't say that there has been a um, relevant um, uh, part of the neo Nazis in the Occupy movement. Um, there's more, more like um, people like the um, who are not talking about politics at all might might be stronger in this Occupy things besides the rather leftist people there. But the Nazis, I think that is too, too chaotic for their, uh, for their uh, interests in a way. Um, the neo-Nazis are, depends a little bit um, on who you count in, but if you look at uh, who gets elected, um, they're between 1.5% and maybe in some areas about six, even some, and, and then there might be some areas where for example, all young men under 30, in this group there might be a, a, like 25% uh, people, uh, as a, um, what do you call it? 25% <laughs> in favor of, of the Nazi party. But, but that is uh, only in, in some areas. At the moment in Germany there has been a major scandal about the, the uh, right-wing extremist party because it, came, it just became clear that uh, there was a series of 10 murders over the last uh, couple of years, um, murders of uh, Turkish and uh, other people throughout Germany and it just um, became clear that the Secret Service was very much 
um, involved in these organizations and in the and the party as well as the well the group who conducted all these murders it's not very you know that's it's very hard to say something really definite about that because the secret service um, got rid of all the papers related to that but it's but it's a major scandal and it and uh, so in the at the moment it's not there's not a public mood in favor of the Nazi party there is a, an everyday uh, reception of racism, of anti-Muslim racism, raising every now and then, especially in the crisis, especially after 9/11, and in Germany, the like the the poorer immigrants and Muslim often is used as a synonym, and um, then there are all these discussions, similar to the UK in a little bit, um, all these discussions about oh they are just a different culture, they don't get rid of their religion, it's them not us, um, so. This is going up and down um, a little bit. And there has been, for example, a former social democrat who has been put out a, um, a book, uh, basically an, an insult against Muslims from the beginning to the end. And he was one of the uh, best sold co um, books that was ever sold on the, on the markets in the last years. So it's hard to tell. You know, this, this uh, I was just thinking when you were talking about it, th th this is something we have too. We, we, which is that, okay, here is capitalism facing probably the biggest crisis it's faced in a very, very long time. And certainly it's getting bigger. And in a sense, it's also, you can see that, you know, the solutions are not available to it partly because of, in a sense, I would say that the way the anarchy of capitalism is playing out also in a political sense. Uh, by which I mean that, you know, we know of the anarchy of capitalism as the fact that there's this competition between capitals and every individual is doing something for his or her own good, they feel, but it ends up actually being worse because of the way that the whole thing works, right? The process works. And I think what's happening now is, let's say in the Eurozone is a classic example, that, the, that finance has created a situation where the political leaders now cannot take the steps that will rescue finance. In other words, it's really capitalism caught in its own te te tentacles. It's a very strange kind of crisis where they have created a politics. You know, this whole this, this narrative of the, the North, the hardworking North versus the lazy South, which is false. But it is preventing the kind of integration which finance now needs right. to survive. Because otherwise you're heading for the biggest banking crisis that we have seen ever, OK? And they can't do anything about it. Yet, the left is unable to capture the popular imagination. Okay? And this is something we know in India, too. It's the same problem we face. And sure, we can blame the media. Yeah. It's, I think it's a huge part of the explanation, the media. Don't question about it. But it's obviously not the only explanation. So I'm, I'm, this is just, I'm just thinking, uh, it, uh, I don't know how seriously I want to take this, but supposing I put it to you that maybe one of the problems is that the left, what we have become is essentially reactive. Mm. We say, don't do neoliberalism, don't cut, don't do austerity, don't do this, don't do that, okay? But we don't really offer it's a very clear, pragmatic, practical vision, okay? And I don't mean that, you know, I don't mean it in the sense of when people say, what is your alternative? Because for every particular situation, we have alternatives. We can always say you shouldn't be doing X, you should be doing Y for that particular situation, you know. Uh, certainly in India we have very clear alternatives. I have German friends who are economists who have very clear alternatives about how to resolve the Eurozone thing. And you know, I mean, Peter Wall and Detlef and Heiner, they're always banging on about what, <laughs> I, and I believe them. I, I take their word for it. You know, the, the, the Keynesian left, you know, alternative is, is there. I don't mean it in that way. I mean that we don't have shall we say, in, you know, the grand vision which gives us that push mm -hmm. to be more positive. Mm -hmm. And, and, I'm, and I, I think maybe that's because we've become very hesitant. You know, all these decades of being pushed back and pushed around, not decades, maybe one decade at least, of being pushed back a lot, has made us less, uh, you tell me what you think, I don't know, less, um, less confident about actually envisioning. I, I've been going to Latin America a lot recently and maybe I'm very influenced by that because the, the difference in the discourse is so palpable. 
they are not talking about what not to do. They are really saying, okay, give us ideas, what more can we do here, what shall we push there? They're, it's completely forward looking, it's completely positive. You know, yeah. and I'm wondering, maybe we're not, maybe part of it is that we're not being sort of energetically positive, you know, we're being yeah. very sort of reactive and saying, oh, don't do the following because, you know, it will be all terrible, which it will be, but <laughs> well, I don't know. What do yeah, you I, think, I think you're right um, in a way that I would say we are lacking concepts that are able to combine some kind of utopian pragmatic and everyday cultural approach. We always have one of those. We have either utopia saying, okay, socialism should look like that, or we have a pragmatic, well, the left reform of the financial system would be the following. And we have people who, who are working on this everyday culture and everyday mode of production uh, level. But I think some kind of, in, in the, um, the, our Institute for Critical Social Analysis and the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, we, we started to favor the term of transformation mm -hmm. over, the, meaning some kind of a combination of reform and revolutionary prospect in a way, um, that is stressing the idea of you know, entries into this transformation here and now, but you still need this horizon of how do you decide and, and what is capturing, as you said, what is capturing the imagina imagination of, of people. And I think in, in Europe, especially in Germany, but of course in Eastern Europe as well, there is a problem with socialism in the popular imagination. People just don't think of something really great and fun and uh, desirable when they hear socialism, which is, I think, um, which yeah. I think is... Yeah. Yeah. is <laughs>
to be a sort of day to day uh, uh, of, of how to maintain the, the occupation in a sense. But I think that the, uh, hopefully, I don't know, I am asking you the question now, that do you think that the, 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 that the questions that have been posed by all are going to be as easy to get uh, to get rid of as the actual tactics have sort of seem to have a physical help? Okay, Shankar also. So two questions, one slightly minor. You said that um, this financial system has created this politics which Germany sort of following on them and us. Um, how this kind of sort of wasn't clear. Secondly, when you talk about um, um, the left parties lacking a vision, and, and if, I mean, see, for me, the way I look at it, I think not having a vision is sort of beneficial because having a vision asks too many questions to you. And in, this, in, in a sense, being negative about things and sort of defeating structures is, in, in a sense, more important than propagating a vision immediately. But in case that you have a vision, how would you sort of describe this vision? Because does it raise too many questions? Uh, I was just wondering what kind of uh, 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 force is behind this Occupy movement. Is it autonomous uh, uh, or spontaneous uh, groups or are they victims or prospective victims of the crisis? And what sort of uh, response has there been of the main German left party that is the link? And, uh, 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 whether it is overt, open or uh, uh, some kind of support, not so open, but is the party uh, uh, just uh, as Jaiti explained that uh, that is uh, mainly reactive or there is some kind of uh, strategy of the party to deal with. And I, actually I was in a, um, a seminar last week uh, organized in India International Center and there the general secretary of three communist parties. The three big communist parties of India was there, and in that party, Comrade Karat was also there, and he agreed that uh, in India, uh, party left is not the only left, and this uh, this question should be considered that uh, party left along with other left should be uh, should come together, and though there are many practical and organizational difficulties and hurdles, I will try. Just remind me if I if I miss something, okay. Um, Maybe I can jump into the middle. Uh, what force is against the, uh, what force is behind the Occupy movement? Well, in Germany, the Occupy movement was quite uh, weak altogether. There were just Berlin and Frankfurt, and well, at the 15th of October, when, oh, okay, sorry. At the 15th of October, when there was this uh, Global Action Day, there were actually about 50,000 people all over Germany coming out. Um, meeting in the streets, but that was something different than the Occupy movement, because that was, I mean, I, I'm, not, um, I'm, I'm not saying any bad things about that, because I think that was astonishing, because it showed that there is some, some people were willing to do something, and there's a lack of organizing around that, um, and that was, that they came out was very much, I think, due to the media. Because there was, although um, there's this very unisono discussion about the crisis, there was kind of this Occupy hype in the German media as well. And then they said, well, and then there's this International Action Day and whoever knows what's going on. And then there's the, there are calls for um, demonstration here and there and there and there. And suddenly there were people there. I mean, after that, they just vanished. They were just gone. <laughs> but so it, it was like a small glimpse that you could mobilize if you knew how, <laughs> but um, but the those parts where there was actually an occupation and something you could really call an occupy movement was only big in Frankfurt and Berlin and in, in a couple of others sometimes really uh, surprising smaller towns but it's it wasn't like something like in the U S so and a lot of people in the occupy movement in in Germany um, well they got very much addressed uh, by the Pirates, which is this very new party that is, um, well, finally, the head of the party said, I'm not a leftist, I'm liberal. So, I mean, I could have told that, <laughs> but, but they are very much playing on this um, transcendency. Politics is kind of too ideolo ideological. 
internet, computer party thing. They are kind of a new phenomena at the moment. And so they are stronger there. And there are a couple of people from Attack and other networks and a couple of uh, from the radical left and the, and the left party as well. But they, in, um, in Germany, the Occupy movement stayed very much distant towards the parties except the pirates because they didn't recognize the party members. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and the, so, um, and they were, I think they were more um, middle class phenomena in Germany than they were, for example, in the US. I think that is very interesting that in a lot of places there has been a true alliance or broader platform at least being built by the Occupy movement that started out with this student protest, then was joined by the leftist organizing scene, like people who were organizing on the ground for years and years and, and moved into the Occupy movement and you know helped build the force it got. I mean that's not that was not an something that happened overnight just, just like that. There were a lot of experienced people there who brought all their skills and their, their uh, experience into that. And, and then there was, were a lot of homeless people joining the, the occupation. I think that was a, a real, in, in the US, I think that was a real challenge for, for them to find a way to communicate and, um, and find a way of not being, being blown up by those people most affected by the crisis joining them. So, so that was, I think, was an interesting proce process. And I don't know if you've ever seen the website they put on, wearethe99percent.org, which I think is a very powerful image of what was going on because there's, it's only a blog and everybody can load up their picture and their story. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who posted their picture and described their living situation there. And that went from I'm a veteran, I don't have, I'm homeless now, and blah, 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 to I'm a student, I'm uh, $400,000 in debt, and um, to I have a small business, and I have f five people uh, working for me, but still I have to buy my clothes in the Swift shop, and going on and on and on without blaming anybody else but the, f the system. <laughs> um, so it was, it was really interesting, I think, and, and I think that captured kind of the new, way of um, thinking about something, some unity that is, mm, you know, it's not analytically totally correct and all these things, but, it's, but it created an image that was kind of new. And I think that was, was um, he was um, uh, dealing with. Um, and in Germany, we had a different um, phenomenon in the midst of May this year. There was, oh yeah, I, sorry, I, I missed one point. And I think what was interesting as well was that part of the Occupy movement, especially in the West Coast, tried to start, uh, started to um, target, um, for example, the, the West Coast industrial ports. You know, they, they have this, I don't know if, if that's, this made the news in, in India, they, they shut down um, West Coast ports, like, um, what's oh, the yes, name? That's right, there was one port in Right, they had this, this one, what, what's the name, uh, just besides San Francisco, uh, the industrial center besides... Uh, mm, yeah, anyway. No, uh, no, I got... Yeah. <laughs> Oakland. Okay. And Oakland had a very vivid uh, Occupy movement and they organized the demonstration down to the port and uh, organized together with the, um, uh, with the rank and file uh, members of the uh, Longshore Union and they just closed the whole port. It was closed for four hours. I mean, that's the biggest uh, industrial um, thing going on in that area. And they tried to repeat that a couple of months, a couple of weeks afterwards, which was okay. But it was the huge success. But it, it was it targeted different parts of the economy. And the other thing is, I think some of these movements connected with the cooperative movements, trying to start different ways of dealing, living together, working together, and, and doing d uh, alternative ways of economy. So in Germany, there was this um, rather hype about this Oakland thing, and, so, and there, were, there was from the more radical left and the left party and attack, we organized together something that was called Blockupy, uh, which was you know, taking up this blocking idea, and it was supposed to block the um, European Central Bank, which is in Frankfurt, um, and supposed to 
be a sign of solidarity to the, towards the other European movements that were fighting so hard. And that was basically, uh, it's difficult to say if that was a success because the whole Frankfurt was blocked because everything was illegal and the whole city was blocked by the police. So you couldn't do anything, but nobody was, could move. I mean, the people living there, they were so pissed <laughs> off. That was, but you couldn't, you, you couldn't hold an occupation or an assembly. You couldn't even, the civil rights movement tried to have an assembly saying, this is a violation of our constitution, and they were banned. There were people holding up the constitution, um, and there was police saying, it's not allowed to hold up the constitution. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's the point. <laughs> so, so there was, there was really some anger building up about that, and then we had this, the, the, the only thing that was not illegal was the demonstration at the last day, and that was really powerful and colorful. And so that kind of worked, although it's hard to tell how it's going on, uh, or what is, what is uh, going out, growing out of that. Mm. Well, and this might be a hint on the concept of how does the left party view the social movements. I think um, first is, it's um, important to understand that the left party in Germany is kind of a merger uh, of the former socialist party of the Eastern Democratic uh, the Socialist um, State in Germany and some radicalized social democrats who were not following the social democratic party towards the neoliberal way, then some leftist um, unionists who haven't been part of the social democrats before. Uh, and some radical lefts and people who were actively integrated into the party, like uh, activists from the migrant movement. And um, so this, the, the forming of the party itself was kind of um, bringing together <coughs> different um, people and different tendencies, understood as linking the party with other people and other leftists, other so social movements. Um, of course, not only the social movements, but, uh, but rooting them in, the, in them as well. So for example, the one, of, one of those, uh, the leaders, Bernd Rixinger, he, is, he was one of, he and I actually were the two sp uh, spokespersons of the We Won't Pay For Your Crisis movement, and he used to be a leftist unionist activist. So it's, it's kind of, I think they're, they're coming back to this concept, that, which was kind of uh, called mosaic left, which is a little bit, yeah. I don't know if it really works in, in English, but it's uh, so bringing together different yeah. fragments and forming them into them, something that is not, not longer just the fragmented left, but maybe adds up to some picture of something new there. That, okay, let, let, let me try and uh, take up uh, uh, Shankar's questions. First, the easier one, which is about what did I mean when I said that, that basically capitalism now has, it has become an octopus caught in its own tentacles. And essentially, uh, the Eurozone is, is a classic example of it, but it's a wider problem. It's true of global capitalism at the moment. And it's, it, it goes like this, which is that the, the way that capitalism has worked in the 20th century is really through an integration of the state with large capital. And that is what has given it stability and et cetera, et cetera, okay? Uh, competition between capitals occurs, of course, but it's more and more moderated by the role of the state, which intervenes effectively to you know, pursue the interests of capital, but uh, in a way that will keep the stability. And of course, that is also why you have had the expansion of finance, because it has been a stability which has not allowed uh, the distributive change that, you know, that Sudhu mentioned. In other words, basically, it, you're suppressing worker incomes. Okay. So you're suppressing worker incomes. Where do you get the demand for your stuff? You get it by giving them credit. Yeah? So you create credit booms. You create asset booms that give people the illusion of wealth and allow them to buy more than their incomes would otherwise allow. That ends up in a crisis. You have a bit of a shock, and then you come back again. Okay? So the 90s in the US was a classic situation. You had the dot-com boom and then the bust, and then you had the housing boom in the 2000s. In Europe, the way this has reflected, and why I'm saying that now it's caught up, because basically you have got into a situation where everybody's too indebted. You can't play that card anymore, okay? Governments are too indebted, private individuals, households are indebted, everybody is trying to reduce their debt level. So you can't keep playing that card now at the moment. 
But finance requires that. At, the, at, at one level, you know, you have created finance because that's how you solved your demand problem. Or you allowed finance to grow because that was the way you solved your demand problem. Finance then becomes a powerful political lobby in itself, which demands that it will get repaid. You do the repayment by transferring the burden onto taxpayers. But that also has its limits, because the more burden you put on the state, the more that becomes unviable, because the state is now also implicated in the financial market. Okay? In Europe, the way it's also playing out politically is that this process whereby banks went out or capital went from north, northern to southern Europe, southern including Ireland, okay, so, you know, bit, bit, of a, bit of a broad brush view of southern, but from the core to the periphery, capital went out from the core to periphery, created a boom there, which was going to be uh, unsustainable, like all developing country debt crises were, you know, all the same kind of boom is created there. When it crashes, however, you have created a politics through the media, through your own emphasis on, you know, prudent debt and all of that. You created a politics that says, no, can't pay. We will not. We will not uh, have the solidarity that, let's say, the North should then provide to the South. Okay? Within the Eurozone, you could have resolved this through fiscal transfers. But there's no way you can do the fiscal transfer because the politics of Germany, Austria, Finland, etc., won't permit it. Because they have, you know, been... Okay, so you've created this Frankenstein monster, which is now out of your control in a sense. So uh, the reason I say this is because I actually met uh, the lords of the universe. There was a conference in Austria of, of these banking types and all these, you know, head of Deutsche Bank, head of American Express, I mean, the lords of the universe, okay? They were terrified. They were completely scared of the said we want euro bonds we want a coordinated expansion you know they were more left Keynesian than I would dream of being because they realized that they are actually heading for disaster okay Armageddon but it's it's now a monster they can't control okay so that's why I'm saying this is this enormous crisis now the second question is actually a very tough question do we really need a clear alternative vision? Because doesn't that just complicate matters? Because the minute you specify it, then you can start getting into arguments. No, not this, but that. And then, you know, then we can fight forever about what exactly. Yeah, which I, I agree with you. I take your point. So what I meant was actually not a very clear vision and in the sense of like a manual. OK, this is the detail of how this future socialist, whatever, some whatever the word is, society is going to be, economy. But more that, a lot of the, um, a lot of the way that we present arguments is often to say, do not do X and Y, okay? Underlying it, we do have a, th a vision of the things that we would rather do instead, but we don't go and push that very confidently, okay? I'm not saying we don't have the, you know, the vision. I think, you know, people are, as I said, not just economists, but a lot of citizens know quite clearly what would be required. Yeah, but, but we don't go out and push it confidently. And that doesn't give us an overarching one narrative. You know, like, we are the 99% is a wonderful slogan to bring everybody, but you also need another thing. You know what I mean? To keep, to create the mosaic as you, you're saying, to bring that mosaic into one. Uh, when you look at the places where there has been political transformation, okay, uh, certainly, you know, a lot of the regimes in Latin America, okay, they're not pure socialist, certainly not communist, etc., but they're certainly something different. And they all came literally like Phoenix rising out of the ashes, right? They came out of political situations that looked like there was nothing and there was no hope and you were really at the, you know, you're dredging the bowl, okay? Thailand, you, you look at, uh, okay, this guy, Taksin Chinawatra, is a personal creep, I'm sure. He's a kind of Thai Berlusconi, all of that. He's a big businessman. But when he was in power, he just did two things that have ensured that some, that if there are democratic elections in Thailand, for, for your children's generation, they're going to vote for that guy, okay? He basically said, we're going to ensure that every citizen of this country has access to institutional credit to do activities, and we're going to give universal free health 
health care. Okay? Now, doing those two has meant so much. I mean, what, what we don't realize is that credit was not just bank credit. It was also dignity to farmers, to workers, to informal sector people, you know? It was, it was, it was, an, it was a, a peculiar roundabout economic way of giving dignity. And universal health care is your ultimate social protection, right? Every, I mean, so he, he had a narrative that somehow, you know, created a thing that lots of people could come around. In Ecuador, in Bolivia, even in Argentina, you get regimes that, you know, who, which are all over the place politically, right? They're, they're just full of all kinds of people because they're umbrella movements. They're like Syriza. They're like whatever is trying to be created in Spain. They're umbrella movements with crazy, you know, uh, Christian healers and uh, uh, crazy traditional healers and very, very, you know, staunch communists and very something like all kinds of people are in there. But there is a narrative that somehow brings them together. So I, I think it's, uh, if I could put it, it doesn't have to be very specific, but it does have to have some broad brush positive things that attract everybody, attract a 99%, which is, goes beyond saying fix those bastards. You know, I mean, it has to be more than just we hate the bankers. It has to be a, a positive thing. thing is that in a way this we are the 99% implied um, reclaiming de democracy on a yeah. different scale and that is often um, a little bit um, under stressed in our discussion that, that it's not just um, it's not it's inequality but it's inequality linked to democracy saying we are living in a system where that serves the 1% and we are <coughs> claiming our part in that and and I think that is that is a um, a good move in that.